Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so just a note, we will be beginning shortly. If you are a member of uh, the Oxford faculty or uh, friends and family of Guy, we have reserved spaces in the first three rows for you. So if you don't mind coming forward, that would be great. Uh, and yeah, thank you, everyone. We hope you enjoy the rest of today. I don't want to talk to more than like uh, two minutes. <laughs> 20, 20, yes, <laughs> 25 maybe. And discussion. Yeah. So are, are we waiting? Shall I just come out and wait until somebody starts? You don't look like you're a student. Right, you'll see, you'll see if I haven't been That's oh, great. Are you the boss of which college? Uh, Corpus. That I'm staying at Corpus, by the way. Yeah. I made a donation already. It's lovely. Very nice. Yeah. It's a nice room. It's 12, 12, ground floor. Yeah, yeah, very nice. No problem at all. And, uh, but, and then, so, uh, one of the students organized it for me. And he's and Miffin, so I so I said, well, what would a hotel cost? And made a donation, and um, and so the bursa or somebody gets in touch with me and says, we don't have you on our list. Could you just like remind us what year you were in? And we, it was good. It was fine. No, yeah, yeah, no, but it was it was fun. I enjoyed the interaction. Well, anyway, I hope I'm, I'm I hope I help. Say again. Where? I'm there, but I'm there for free. Yeah, yeah. But I made, a, I made a good donation, so the college is making money on it. <laughs> Pardon? I, uh, no, I know, but I, I made, I confess to Brazeners that I was, um, I was unfaithful, and, that's, and they're, they've forgiven me. Yeah. So it's pretty special for me to be here. Yeah, it's pretty special. So my, my wife and son are here, which is hilarious. So, uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, which one? Yeah, you, you. So you'll be able to stand up and say this guy knows nothing. No. And by the way, this is more sort of like it's less uh, asset managementy and more like sort of how to manage your life. What to get right and wrong? Because we've had. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm ready for you. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, and they'll get bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Um, I have a question. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to start our, our talk today by our slide share. Um, but first, I just wanted to introduce your, uh, you all to the, the Oxford Alpha Fund and then obviously to our speaker. Um, so the Oxford Alpha Fund is the investment society at, at the University of Oxford. So we primarily specialize in fundamental analysis um, of equities, and we recently started a fund of all sorts. Yes. Um, but in terms of our speaker, so you know, we're, we're delighted to welcome Guy Spear here today. Um, many of you might know Guy Spear um, as the person who spent a considerable fortune on, on lunch uh, with, with Warren Buffett, uh, where he claimed that uh, he became a true value investor. Um, he also manages the Aqua Marine Fund, a fund based in Zurich, which focuses on long-term capital appreciation and uh, value investing. And um, in terms of why we're here today in Brazenose, Guy is obviously uh, an alum, uh, where he studied BP and graduated with a first class degree, and also did uh, tutorials with uh, one of our more recent prime ministers, David Cameron. Um, but without further ado, I would like to um, invite all of you to welcome Guy Spear today to give a talk on investing at a time of financial crisis. Thank you. Can, you, can you hear me? Does the mic work and everything? So it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. I'm slightly nervous. We've got a birth of a colleague here. We've got my son. We've got some friends and teachers who live in Oxford. And we've got a bunch of students. So uh, hopefully I will um, uh, be worth your time. My plan is to speak for about 25 to 30 minutes and give you plenty of ammunition to ask questions. So. By the time we get to the end of 20 to 25 minutes, I could also go on for an hour, but I think that some of you will lose interest. And so be prepared to hear things that you disagree with, uh, questions you want to ask. Uh, the more challenging, the better, and start making notes now. And the one other thing that I would share with you is that I think that the benefit of having somebody like me here is not because of the, I have anything specific to teach, but because I can serve as an example of somebody who is further down the road to where you are. And hopefully, if I'm open and honest and share enough with you, you will have an example in your mind that will enable you to make better decisions down the road. And so with that in mind, uh, my talk, I think, probably has less to do with investing and more to do with life. I titled the talk. Uh, investing at a time of tectonic shifts because I thought it would get the most students here, in part. Uh, but I also think it's extraordinarily relevant. I don't think that when I was here at Oxford, uh, I felt that the, the ground was moving underneath our feet in the same way that the ground is moving today, uh, whether that is climate change, which for me, the best analogy is it's a bit like an asteroid that's moving towards planet Earth. We don't know what the impact would be if it actually hit. And we really ought to try and avoid that impact. But as we've seen, it's particularly hard to get a whole bunch of countries with different interests to uh, coincide and take global action. It's also deeply unsettling to see when, when I graduated in 1989, the United States or the West had just won the Cold War. And so we would move to a unipolar world where the West had won. And now we live in a world where a rising China makes it very clear that an authoritarian method of running an economy is the way they plan to continue, which is deeply, deeply unsettling, I think, for those of us who are being educated in the West. And so if you came here with answers, I don't have any grand theoretical answers, but I do have some really important answers about how I plan to live my life and how I would might live my life from your perspective and some of the mistakes that I made along the way, and maybe you won't make those mistakes. Um, and so just a little bit of how many people here went to Brazenose? So just a few. Uh, I came here and I studied law. I hated law. I was miserable. I spent a lot of time in the Stalybras Law Library pounding through case law. And, and then when I think about it now, uh, I, I realize that there are a number of times when my engagement with law studies, which I hated, 
uh, were super valuable. About four or five years ago, a company that I had an investment in was dragged through bankruptcy court against my will in a way that uh, came as a total surprise to me. Uh, a number of vulture funds had gotten hold of this company's debt and engaged in actions which were legal but not, not kosher, if you like. And I think that my actions were grounded in the fact that I'd studied law for a couple of years. Uh, they were grounded in the fact that I'd uh, engaged sufficiently with the academic work here to give me the confidence to lead an equity committee for a year, which didn't get me, we, we didn't get anything at the end of the day, but at least I led the equity committee well. Uh, there are just a couple of other memories that I'd like to share with you. The room up there, which I don't remember what it's called, was the site where we studied Roman law with a guy called Professor Peter Burks, who's no longer around. He used to come down from the University of Edinburgh to teach Roman law. And again, I think that at the time I spent, I, I thought quite a lot that uh, it wasn't really very useful. I think that living in Switzerland, uh, the background in Roman law, Swiss and European law is kind of based on Roman law. It gives me a far better understanding of the legal system that I'm operating in. I guess what's my point to you? Uh, my point to you is, is a kind of a Steve Jobs point, which is that the things that seem the most irrelevant, the things that you think are completely useless, are actually not useless. And But the, the great regret and the great mistake that I think that I made was that there were so many things that I did not take seriously because I thought they were useless. And I didn't realize that what was happening was that every single bit of stuff that was being put in front of me, whether it was literature, whether it was law, whether it was some stupid economic model that would not apply in the real world, was actually giving me a little bit of something that I would be able to draw upon uh, later in time. And so if any of you here are cruising, <laughs> I very, very strongly urge you not to cruise. Uh, take every single bit of what you're doing and uh, imagine yourself storing it up and find ways to kind of like summarize it for yourself and return to it and assume that everything is going to be useful at some point. Uh, that story of um, my study of law is one story, a far better story if you've not seen it, is the graduation speech that uh, Steve Jobs gave to a group of graduating students talking about the study not of calligraphy, but of how you make letters, uh, printed letters, and the different designs for letters, and how that came in useful uh, when he created his first Apple Mac. So uh, mistake number one that I had was not paying attention. Then I kind of want to um, share with you something that is a, is a model for me that just keeps coming back to me time and again. And that is that the average age in this room is under the age of 30, lucky you. But there's this kind of change in the way our minds work that happens after the age of 30. And I think that uh, I suffered sufficient setbacks before the age of 30 that I was able to adjust. But uh, some of my friends, both from Oxford and from business school, did not make those adjustments or didn't hit the setbacks until after their age 30, and then it's far harder. So um, uh, what, what is the kind of course or the path that I took out of university was to assume that I was smarter than everybody around me. I developed this innate arrogance and sort of snarkiness, which was completely unjustified uh, but it was something that kind of I just absorbed from the environment. And I don't really know enough about Oxford today to know if it allows you to graduate with a sense of humility or not. Uh, but that was not what I graduated with. And at the same time, the environment both trained my mind, but it, it also trained me to be able to sound smart and to put up a verbal barrage of stuff that uh, 
if you'd had the same educational training as me, you would smile and engage with it. And if you did not have the same educational training as me, it would often engender in the recipient or in the hearer the sense of, well, this guy's smart and I'm not going to bother trying to explain anything to him. I'm just going to let him continue because there's no point engaging. And the very strange thing is, is that I think that for a period of about eight years, I was in a kind of a bubble where I could cruise along with that arrogant sense that I was better than everybody else. And the, the sad truth is that everybody crashes and burns sooner or later. And the question is, how soon do you do it? Because that's when the rubber really hits the road and when you really get to start learning. In my case, that happened around, well, in the job that I took after business school, which is written up in the first chapter of my book, which I have no expectation for any of you to have read, so it's OK. Uh, where I took a very bad choice, and there were plenty of understandable reasons why I made that choice. Um, but I suddenly was thrown back and discovered that all of my learning, all of my credentials, all of my capacity to be verbally dazzling, all of my capacity to demonstrate to somebody in the room that I was somebody who was quite smart, did not help me at all. And I was looking around me in this uh, bank, uh, which felt a bit like the bank in Wolf of Wall Street, if any of you have seen that movie. Literally, I made a really bad choice to go and work there. But I saw people around me who were achieving success, and I was not achieving success. And so here's the pattern that if, I, if, if, if this goes into any of your minds, and um, you end up doing something differently in your life, and you end up writing to me, I'll be happy. I feel like this talk will have been worthwhile. So the first thing that happened to me is I met with failure, and I met with unable to make progress and succeed, was that I went back to the things that had worked for me in the past, and the things that I trained myself so hard to do. So try and be the smartest person in the room, dazzle people verbally, do all sorts of things that you actually see people doing in Parliament all the time. Uh, and you see that sort of narrow group of people who graduated from Oxford who are now running the country doing. And it works for them in the very narrow world of British politics. And they kind of, somebody wins. But if you go into a broader world, a globalized world, I was living in New York, that was not going to work. And then I think that what's fascinating, I need to pause and welcome our principal, John Bowers. He wanted to sneak in, but it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you here. He's going to walk out in a minute, which is going to sound like a vote of no confidence. But I want you to know that he told me beforehand that um, he's going to have to leave at some point. So, uh, so there I was at, I feel like I need to, if it was anybody else, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. But I feel like because it's the principal, I need to summarize where I've gotten to so far. But, I'm talking about all my mistakes in life. And this watershed time that I feel happens around 30. So I am suffering failure after failure where I'm not succeeding. There are people who are former drug dealers at this investment bank, literally Wolf of Wall Street type place, who are experiencing more success than I am. And they're experiencing more success because they have skills that I don't have. And they uh, did not spend their time training their mind in an academic environment. They were trained in a very, very different way. The rough and tumble of a not very good Wall Street firm, the rough and tumble of sales, the rough and tumble of marketing. But I just wanted to go back to what I knew. And uh, the only way I could have really genuinely gone back to what I knew would have been really I, either to go back to the UK where uh, people would have been impressed with my credentials and the way I spoke, or perhaps to go back into an academic environment. But I can say that age uh, uh, 27, 28 was when I really started learning the skills that I needed to learn. I believe that if that had happened to me three or four years later, I may not have really acquired those skills because my mind would have been become too set in its ways. And so what's my point to everybody here is that don't wait until you're 27, 28, 29 
because it may end up being too late and you'll become kind of, and you're getting an incredible and extraordinary training here, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being left out uh, that you will never learn here that I'm gonna try and share with you as I look down at my notes and see what's next on this talk. <laughs> so just a couple of other mistakes for me. Um, uh, if I look back, so my children originally studied in Montessori schools, and I think that one of the most incredible things that Montessori education teaches you is not to fear trying something, even if you may not get it right away, and you sit in classes where the kids might be two years older than you, and that's not a problem, and you look to try stuff out and learn. I think already by the time that I got here, I had this enormous fear of failure and an enormous fear of uh, not looking good in front of my peers. I just wrote a review of this book, uh, Chums, that was written by Simon Cooper, where I describe how I never once spoke at the union. Uh, and, and I was utterly uh, made scared. I was fearful of speaking in front of some of these great lights who are now running the country. And I just, it's, what an extraordinarily dumb thing. Uh, and, you know, I think that it is inevitable that if we have any amount of success in life, we will get ourselves into environments where there's fear of being an imposter, fear of being made to look stupid, fear of people laughing at us uh, because we tried and did not succeed. And uh, I just want to share this thought with you. I think this thought applies to me today, is that um, the, the, it's, it's not... I mean, it's, it's, it's a well-known phrase, but it's, it's not that the, 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 the measure of our success will be the number of times we put ourselves in a situation where we're willing to fail and look stupid. And the people that we see, for the vast majority who are succeeding at anything, we may not see behind the curtain, but the reality is, is that they were willing to put themselves time and again into a situation where they were capable of failing. And I can say that today, uh, for example, what I really ought to do is get involved with my fund in some situations where I'm more exposed publicly, where uh, I take a more public position, where I'm likely to look stupid, and actually I don't do it enough. And I think that if I could go back to uh, as early as possible and find ways to train myself to be comfortable with failure, and I actually developed an interest in golf at one point because it's not the moment that you hit the ball and it's not the moment that you hit the ball and it's, it goes well, but it's that moment when you hit a lousy shot and you go um, gardening is what my wife would call it. And managing that emotion exactly after uh, you've had that lousy shot and learning to welcome, not welcome it, but to be familiar with it, know how to live with it, know how to get past it, and know that, that each time you get one of those setbacks, you're actually on your path to success. You just have to keep doing it for long enough, and you have to actually shorten the cycle uh, by which you do that. So um, you don't want to have a, a nasty experience or an experience where I failed in some way or other, and then not put myself out in the world for another two years because that's going to limit the number of time, opportunities I get. By contrast, those who I've seen are successful are the ones who they, they go straight back at it and they're increasing their probabilities of success and learning just because they're getting uh, more of those. Uh, you know, one other... Uh, uh, so why did I go and work at this snake pit in New York City? Uh, part of the reason why I went to work there was that the CEO offered me to be a vice president. And I thought that was great coming straight out of business school. And it was, and, and there was, I had this extraordinarily powerful external scorecard uh, that wanted me to look like a success right away. He also dangled the opportunity to make lots of money quite quickly under my nose. And uh, while I do not fault myself for not really understanding the nature of the firm that I was going to work at. And for your interest, there was nothing like being able to Google somebody. You had to go to the business school library and look up in microfiche what reports had been written about the guy. And there were one or two. But what I do fault myself 
for is seeking status. And I think that uh, seeking status is almost always a mistake. And also, uh, the desire just to make money for the sake of making money, which is a kind of seeking status, I was, and rather, what I should have done is seek to work for somebody that I admired, uh, somebody who I thought was doing a good job, in however that was, because an enormous amount of learning comes out of that. I should have sought to do something that was genuinely and deeply interesting to me. So uh, just a few, uh, then one, one last kind of like generic mistake that I, I think that, so um, one of the evaluations in this organization YPO uh, for uh, chapter chairs and chapter officers is does the person live by the values of the organization and do they, um, uh, do they demonstrate the values of the organization by their actions? So the question that comes up for me is that if I voluntarily joined an organization that I fully respect, then that ought to be the mode of operation. But what if we find ourselves a part of an organization that we don't fully respect, where there are whole aspects of what the organization stands for and what it does that are not entirely aligned with what we are. And I think that is a far more common experience, whether that is a school that we might be in, or it might be that you're uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and you're part of the Communist Party in Russia, or you're uh, F.W. de Klerk and you're part of the apartheid system. And I think that it is easy enough and it, it, is, it is kind of like the path of least resistance to say, well, the values of this organization don't really align with mine, and therefore I'm going to disengage, and I don't really care. And I think that, and, and I'm going to just find a way through. And I think that I spent a significant part of my life inevitably finding that I, my values did not align with the organization that I was a part of, down to living in the UK as an immigrant, uh, not considering myself British, and saying uh, I plan to leave at the first opportunity, which I did, or being part of a college and not really feeling aligned. And I think that if I look at the examples of F.W. de Klerk and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, what the challenge for us is that we don't squeeze the best juice out of life if we take that unengaged approach. So the challenge is not an easy one, but the challenge is actually to fully engage while fully understanding that the values of the organization don't align with our values and finding a way uh, to support it, but actually get to a place where you can maybe even make a change. I, I, uh, another contemporary of mine from Oxford who's now in the government is Jeremy Hunt. And I think that he's actually, I'm not, I, sh I exchange an email with him every one or two years just saying happy Christmas or something like that. He's a busy guy. And, but I think that he's actually done a really, really extraordinary job at doing that in that he was against Brexit, uh, but he, he found a path to be a part of the government when many people like Rory Stewart left the Conservative Party. He, he bided his time and I think that it may be that right now he's making a huge difference to the future of the country in a way that maybe nobody else in the Conservative Party could. I'm not saying, so that is an extraordinarily, that, that requires enormous amounts of intelligence, enormous amounts of ability to kind of carefully analyze and think through what is going on and what moves you want to make. I'm, I have not had this conversation with Jeremy, but I noticed that his father was an admiral in the British Navy and I suspect that through many conversations with his father, he's kind of learned to have that nuanced approach. I think that if I think of the institutions that I've been part of, there are times when I've been utterly disengaged. When I was at business school, I was utterly disengaged. I had a lot of kind of almost disrespect for the institution because I thought that everybody was stupid and this was just a country club. That is not a way to go through life. I would have... I didn't take the academics seriously. I took the socializing quite seriously. But that is the way to go through life is to find a way within ourselves to embody the values of the organization, even if we disagree with so much that the organization stands for, will be more effective. So I got through my first page of notes here. 
I should tell you I'm, uh, I have, uh, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. I take 20 milligrams of uh, Vyvanse or Elvance a day, but I left my original set of notes at home, so, but it's okay. I uh, rewrote them. So I just want to go to that period of my life where the rubber hit the road and change really, really took place because I think that, um, I don't think that they will be the same tools for you if and when they happen, but perhaps by hearing a little bit of my story, then you know, it will wake up, open up chakras in your minds that will enable you to take better decisions when the time comes. And just to be clear, I've decided not to pursue an academic route in life and I've gone to business school and now I've graduated and I wanna make money and I wanna have status. And I've gone to work at a place called D.H. Blair, which is really just like the place Wolf of Wall Street. And the ethics there are terrible. Uh, the place was shut down about five years after I left by the authorities for having violated all sorts of security rules. Uh, they were um, taking ad advantage of widows and orphans. It was not uncommon for me to be in the elevator. And my office was on the second floor and the brokers were on the 14th floor. And there were women who were scantily dressed who were certainly not going for a client meeting on the 14th floor. It was pretty, pretty gross. And you can ask yourself, and I asked myself why I stayed there. But I was kind of, I felt like I was caught in a bind because um, if I left, I would have nothing to show for it. <laughs> I, I went, I made a mistake, and I wanted, I, I had commitment and consistency bias, and I said, uh, I need to come out with some kind of prize, something that uh, says that I've made a success of this, which was actually a very bad idea. What I really should have done, and if I'd have learned to fail better, I would have been able to say, well, <laughs> that was a mistake, uh, put my tail between my legs, accepted it, told my friends, and moved on to whatever was next with the very damaged reputation. And just to give you a sense of the damaged reputation, if somebody goes and, you know, the question that people are asking now about uh, Bankman Freed or anybody who was around him was, uh, well, assuming that it comes out that there was fraud, which I suspect that there was, was anybody around him, were they either in on the fraud and making money with him, uh, or were they too, too stupid to realize that there was fraud going on? Either way, I don't want to have anything to do with anybody in his circle. So by going to work at this firm, D.H. Blair, I had um, either created, I created a situation where somebody says, well, why did he go do that? Either he was part of the system and he was somehow making money out of it and he just fell out with these people and now wants to leave, or he was too stupid to figure out what was going on. Either of them, not good things. And at that point, all my academic credentials, uh, all of my capacity to be verbally coherent and dazzle people verbally to win arguments, none of that was going to help me. So what did help me? And um, so I, I want to start with a figure that is controversial, but he really made a huge difference for me, is this guy, Anthony Robbins. I don't know if anybody here has experienced Anthony Robbins, but uh, Anthony Robbins is a motivational coach. And I think that why I, I say it hesitantly is that he doesn't always walk his talk, but I found that the ideas that he had for me were extraordinarily powerful in that he taught me that how I feel about any particular circumstance in life has got nothing to do with the external world. It's how I'm reacting to it. And I can choose in any moment my reaction, and I can train myself to react positively to negative things that unfold. And I, I don't understand why it took me so long for that to uh, come out, but, but it was the first time that I experienced it. And in a certain sense, you know, if, if there's only one thing that we ever have to learn in our education, it's that when bad things happen, we don't have to feel bad about it. We don't have to feel like we're failures. So, I went to multiple seminars. The seminar was called Unleash the Power Within. And I literally, and I started realizing that I had to get out of my head and retrain myself in a kind of a physical way. Because when we experience failure, it happens to us physically. It hits us in the gut. So it's actually not an intellectual thing. If we go into the mind, 
it doesn't help us. And what we are all taught at the world's great universities is to solve every problem by going into the mind. And you know, there are problems that, like what I was facing right then, that going into my mind wasn't going to help me. So I just wanted to put that out there. And exactly the so if you would have had me just graduating from Oxford, if you would have had me attending seminars by an Anthony Robbins, I don't think that uh, I, I don't think I would have done it. I would have poo-pooed it. I needed some distance, and I kind of will feel good if you know you you see things that can teach you stuff, and just because they don't have the right academic dressing, uh, they're worthwhile things to learn. Um, I want to share three books. That again, when I, if you read them straight, if you, they're probably not even in the library here. And they're kind of tacky, but on another level, they, they taught me a lot. So, so one, the title I've got, so somebody's writing down notes, that's good. Um, one is by a guy called Napoleon Hill, and it's called Think and Grow Rich. Uh, and it's, it's really extraordinary and surprising, but, but that book helped me a lot, and I've read it multiple times. Uh, another one is by a guy called Dale Carnegie, don't forget put off by the title, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And that changed the way I approached people in an extraordinary way, and maybe in Q&A we can get into more. Uh, and then there was a third book that I'm going to refer to, but I don't see it on the page, so maybe I won't. won't. Um, but I want to share two more points, and I just want to tie this back to why this what has this got to do with investing at a time of tectonic shifts? So uh, I could come here and give you a whole bunch of theoretical mumbo jumbo that will dazzle all sorts of people, especially if I'm an institutional environment trying to raise money from some fund and I can come with some theory on inflation, on some theory on what businesses will succeed uh, or where uh, the uh, investor's money should be invested right now for the optimal investment success. And I do have a lot of ideas, and I have to have some working thesis about where the world is going. And I guess I, I will share just a few of them right now to just sort of like those of you who thought you were coming to investment talk actually get something related to investing. Uh, but then I'll go to kind of like two more kind of killer apps that I think, because the world is far too complicated and the, there's too much going on and there's too much that I can't predict, that we can't predict, that will generate success. So uh, what really it comes down to is, the, is this capacity to fail and these personal wiring and how we take care of ourselves and how we manage ourselves that will allow us to survive and thrive in a world of shifts. But just to go and talk about the tectonic shifts for a second, uh, I, I just want to start with a, a very, very, very um, uh, simple idea that is pretty much uh, every, not every, most of the investments that I have are centered around some simple ideas. Jeff Bezos has said that in a world where everything is changing, look for that which is not changing. And there are some things that don't change. People want stuff, and they want it conveniently and cheaply. And if you have a business that can deliver stuff to people ever more conveniently and cheaply, as Amazon does, then you've got yourself a winner. And probably a third of the ideas in my portfolio are simply uh, investments where I can see that the company is committed to delivering stuff to people that they want at uh, uh, an ever cheaper price. And they're, they're dedicated to finding ways to do that. Amazon is an example. Costco is an example. Uh, the other thing that happens to people that and this is not changing is that as people become rich and there's lots of rich people or people, lots of people around the planet becoming richer, they look for increasingly um, expensive ways to make themselves feel special. So I know that there will be many people here who think that a Louis Vuitton handbag is a waste of money, but it's actually less expensive than a vacation, and it lasts a lot longer than a vacation, and makes the person who's bought the Louis Vuitton handbag feel absolutely great about themselves. Uh, or you could go all the way to a very expensive Ferrari, which is the male version of stiletto heels. I understood from my wife, whom I love very much, who's sitting here, 
uh, that uh, at a certain age, wearing high heels makes a woman feel fabulous. And pretty much at any age, owning a Ferrari, not that I've owned one myself, I just own the shares, makes a man feel fabulous. And I think that what's fascinating is in spite, I, don't, I think that those, those kinds of aspects of human nature are gonna continue through time. And when I, if you look at the universe of possible investments that I can make, I kind of focus on the two or three percent of the opportunities that represent, you know, those are the two, two of the big ideas. Uh, one, one third idea is that people like certainty and they like to save time. And uh, brands save people time and give them certainty. But I can dive into that. Uh, just to go back a little bit to the many models of the world that are being pushed into our heads or hopefully being absorbed by us. You know, I started this talk by saying that I did not pay enough attention to all the things, even though I thought they were useless. You will not believe when patterns that you've learned in a stupid legal text or in some biochemistry class actually come up useful and we wanna have uh, our minds working around them fast and easily. I think for the vast majority of time, what happens to me in the world of investing is that people come up with these cute ideas and I can discard them because I've spent so much time maybe studying them in academic environments. Having said that, you need a working hypothesis. Those are some of my working hypotheses. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that we're going to a multipolar world. I watch China extraordinarily carefully. Uh, and uh, all of my investments that are China related are predicated on the idea that the Chinese leadership will behave rationally, and I have no guarantee in my mind that they will behave rationally, but I, I, at the end of the day, if you ask me to throw the dice, I believe that they will. There's no guarantee. China does not have the capacity to reboot itself the way liberal democracies do. China was the richest nation uh, in around the 15th century, but did not successfully reboot until about uh, 1989 or so uh, when um, Deng Xiaoping came along. Another tectonic shift that I'm super excited about is the rise of India. Uh, India is quite closely allied with Russia, but I increasingly will be less so, and I believe that we have the makings of a country that will support the liberal rules-based international order view of the world rather than the Chinese view, which is something different that we're just going to have to learn to live with. Um, I'm still trying to come to grips with what climate change means for me. I can't say that I have made any significant decisions inside of the small microcosm of a world that I operate in to uh, have an impact on climate change. But one, um, I, I gave the analogy, there's no doubt that if a asteroid was heading towards Earth with unknown consequences, we'd hopefully get together as a planet and take action to avert the worst, and um, we're not doing that with climate change. I know that I'm called upon to do something, I'm just not sure what. So I just wanna leave you with two kind of pillar apps, which, because, I, and I wanted to touch on those just to make you feel that like you learned something or you heard something investing related, but I really think that this kind of, the stuff, I'm gonna go back to this technology of personal success, if you like, that I, I think is, more important, and, uh, and it's actually three. And then, and then we'll see if uh, anybody wants to engage me with any of that. So the first one that I really didn't understand uh, for the longest time is to be absolutely brutally honest in all circumstances with oneself and with the world. And um, you know, 99% of honesty gets you about 50% of the way. It's really, really that last 1% and that certain trust that people have that you're going to be, see it, say it as you see it, even when there's nobody there to call you out on it. Uh, the people, so, so this happened to me around getting into the circle of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, who is that way, and getting into the circle of this investor, Monish Pabrai, who for some reason, miraculously, or I don't know exactly what the circumstances are that made him that way, but there's a speed 
there's a sense of confidence that you can have in your world when you're surrounded by people like that. And people like that tend to be successful, and they tend to draw people into their lives that are successful. It does mean that you're often saying things that you don't want to say just because they're true. And the benefits of being brutally honest only come later in time. One of the first times that I really did that, well, one of the first times is funny. Uh, I used to be late for dinner at home in Zurich, and so my wife's wondering where I am, and I just want to say, well, you know, I'm at the train station when I actually haven't left the office. And through various experiences, I realized that it's just not worth doing it. Call it exactly as it is, say exactly where you are, and uh, far better things will come to you. The other example, which is a far more important one, yes, in the first chapter of my book, I wrote about this D.H. Blair experience, and there was a huge part of me that really wanted to just pretend it never happened and just kind of sweep it under the rug. And I think that everything, all much of the happiness and success that has come to me professionally has happened because I was just brutally honest in that chapter about the reality. And actually, that chapter led to brutal honesty in another chapter in the book with, around how I dealt with the financial crisis. And there's, there's a kind of a, so, so Manish Pabrai would say that you can commit mass murder and the world will forgive you if you're honest about what you've done and you've done and you're genuinely sorry for it and you make genuine amends for it, which is kind of a remarkable thing if you agree with it. What the world will not tolerate is somebody who does something bad and tries to sweep it under the rug. And it's just so tempting to do that. So uh, that willingness to be brutally honest and to wait, you, you may have to wait a while before the rewards from that come, but they will come. So the second, the second idea that I don't, this is an example, by the way, of the second idea, which is to do more work in public. I think that those of us who are here at Oxford, we spend all this time writing essays, or if you're in the art subjects, writing essays, producing work for a, uh, for a tutor that we read out once a week or so. I, don't, I only realized recently that, that it's a real shame to let it stop there. What we should be doing is taking our work and then it's so easy these days, we can give a talk, which is what I'm doing right now. We can share it on a blog, we can tweet it out. Uh, so the minute we work in public, first of all, we have to overcome the courage, we have to have the courage to suck. Because inevitably, some of the things that we've produced will suck, and it's got to do with that idea of failure and being willing to take failure. But if we, if to the extent that I've had the courage to suck, and every single person who produces stuff that is exposed to the public has overcome that courage to suck. And every now and then they will suck. But the reward is that you will get feedback and you will get engagement and you will get people talking to you that you've never met. And, and I, or you, I should say, I have learned more from those people than I could have ever learned if I, certainly if I'd not done that work in public. And I look back and I say, and I, very genuinely, I feel like I've made, say, good progress in my professional career. But I would be so far, so much further ahead. I'd be so much more successful. I'd have so much more of what I want in life if I'd had the courage to suck earlier, if I'd had the courage to suck more often, if I'd been willing to put my work out there and allow people to see it more often. And I think that the world is an extraordinary place. I, and it's got nothing to do with one's abilities. There are plenty of people. So, so if you could take this room randomly and divide it between people who work, to choose to work in public and people who choose not to work in public, and the ones who work in public will end up, you know, I'll bet, I'll put all my money on them. I'd like 5% of their income, and I'll sell short all the people who choose not to work in public. And I don't need to know anything else about, you know, how smart you are, how honest you are, anything else. That, that would be enough, and so I urge you to take the skills that you're learning here and use them in public, maybe even while you're here. If I'd been here again, I would have sought to write for the college newspaper. Uh, and if the college newspaper didn't accept my work, I would have just published it on a blog or else I would have tweeted it out. Don't take, um, don't take multiple rejections as a reason not to do. Just say, thank you so much. And just briefly, I had a trainer in Zurich once, it starts to rain and, and I'm like, who, who likes to run in the rain? And he said, you need to catch yourself in the moment. And I'm going back to a previous point. 
you need to catch yourself in that moment of, so that you collapse on yourself. Something sinks inside you. You want to catch your mind and, and, and override it with, yes, rain. Yes, failure. Thank you. And, and like, get rid of this kind of, like, whatever it is that is triggered by that. And that difference and training that, and we have to train that time and time again. Last point. Uh, so um, I will send out, I'm not sure I want to confess to this, but it's an example of brutal honesty. So uh, we will send out 9,000 holiday cards this year. And it's slightly, it's an example of me being slightly sort of like, uh, I don't know what it is. I, I know that that's not normal and it's slightly weird. But um, when I first figured out this power of reciprocation, uh, what I did in New York was I would buy bags of sweets and I'd literally hand out a sweet to random people. And just to take you back to the book by a guy called Robert Cialdini, so he takes the example, he's a psychologist at the University of Arizona. So he takes the example of um, Harry Krishna uh, uh, volunteers who are looking for donations at the airport and you're coming into the airport and all you want to do is catch your flight and you're probably late. And Harry Krishna volunteers are handing out paper flowers. And you know, a few meters later, there are donation boxes for Harry Krishna. And you know, doing experiments with Harry Krishna, the yield on donations when you've given them a stupid tacky paper flower that they drop is through the roof. And so there's an extraordinary return on that. And it's simply that the human mind is wired to reciprocate. And so the thing that I did, and I think it's smart for all of us to do it, is to find ways to trigger that reciprocation tendency in as many different ways as possible. And sending out Hollywood Day cards and giving somebody a nice feeling of, oh, you thought about me, I got a holiday card, is one way to do it. But there are... Um, you know, there is an infinite number of ways to do it, and we can do it in ways that are good for us and, and feel good for us. And my experience around every single person that I've seen that's had extraordinary success is that they do these things naturally, including once sitting beside Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, the various interactions I've had with Warren Buffett, who's doing this stuff constantly in, in significant and insignificant ways. And, you know, I just want to tie it back, and then I'm going to stop, and who knows, we'll maybe just go to dinner, or maybe we'll have a discussion, uh, to investing in a time of tectonic shifts. I cannot claim that I have any idea what's going to unfold in the world, and I, other than a few very basic heuristics, I cannot claim to know the best way to invest the money of my investors, my family, uh, but I do know this. I know that those kind of, these kind of tools, brutal honesty, learning in public, growing goodwill, uh, are kind of like guaranteed to result in a happy, interesting, fulfilled life for those people who practice it. And so uh, uh, that's where I'm going to stop and see what happens. You're about to clap. Okay. <laughs> So now we have some time for Q and A. Um, so yeah, myself and Nikai will be passing around the mic if anyone would like to ask any questions. Well, hello there. Uh, greetings from Austria. My name. So you're in Switzerland. I have a question regarding uh, China because I studied. Synology China studies for three years, and now I work in venture capital. Um, when it comes to your honesty, how would you tell your investors that an investment in a Chinese company turns out to be more connected to the Chinese government than you expected it to be? How would you react to such a situation, or how would you deal with it? Sure. So, should I stay seated, or I think we can go back here? I think the sound is better. 
Somebody, somebody left their phone behind. That's why. Uh, that's your phone. Um, so, uh, for those of you who've not been watching, uh, so I had we visited China in 2018, was it around there? And we had a guide who gave various different possible models for China's development and. One model that I actually believe was possible at the time was that China becomes a version of Japan or Korea. So basically, it joins our Western rules-based international order that um, we're so proud of. We're working hard on it, and it's violated all the time, but we're proud of it. And I think that the, it's way better thought out than I ever thought, expected it to be. And when I kind of study it, you know, going from the feast of Westphalia and the rules that were thought out then to other rules on the law of the sea and how we allow uh, superpowers, even powers with nuclear weapons, to kind of figure out a way to live together through these international bodies is actually extraordinary. China has no interest. <laughs> China is never, ever going to be, I believe now, a fully-fledged member of the rules-based international order. You know, uh, a, a statement that... But it was Kevin Rudd, former uh, Australian Prime Minister, who said um, the Communist Party of China won power through the barrel of a gun, and it makes no apology for that. And that's kind of like just simmering below the surface. It doesn't have origin stories of we the people came together in the Constitutional Convention to decide how we're going to run this country that we've just won, which is only two is a model that's only 200 or so years old. And so I think that I, I do have two investments in China, and it seems to me that many of us, including me, were blindsided by some of the actions that the Chinese uh, took with regard to one company is called Alibaba, uh, and, and, many, many of, and there are many interpretations of exactly what they did and why they did it. There are some arguments that say that actually the Chinese government is acting in the interests of the Chinese population, and they're doing things that people in the West would love to do. They regulated tutoring colleges, which are kind of a way for Chinese students, rich Chinese students, to jump the queue in admissions. And some people in the West said, that's great. Or they regulated uh, some, what some people said were market abuses by the gaming companies and the Alibaba, which is kind of a version of Tencent. And then there's another aspect where people just say they behaved in a totally autocratic way. Uh, and so I just, I mean, I guess, how do I do it? I talk honestly about it the way I am right now, and that is about the level of my understanding. I don't claim to have any far deeper understanding of it. Uh, the only last thing that I would add is that I think that a lot of mistakes can be covered by um, position sizing. So I have to be careful to size my positions relative to what might happen, and I'm inevitably going to get that wrong. Uh, I think that I've sized my positions right in China, although one position is giving me, in a certain way, huge problems because it's appreciated so much that um, I don't want to trim my roses and water my weeds at the same time if it becomes 25% of the portfolio that I run or 50%. At what point do you take money off the table? I don't know if that's helpful, but I appreciate the question. Hi, Guy. I'd like to say thank you very much for giving this talk. I guess my question was, um, how did the 2008 financial crisis impact you? And I guess what was your response? Yeah, so it was not a happy time. And uh, so my portfolio, so... You know, what are some of the more heuristics by which I operate? So I didn't have any short exposure. And uh, uh, for those of you who, so if you short a stock, you basically profit when it goes down, not when it goes up. There's some mechanics involved. There are all sorts of reasons why I figured out that that's a dumb idea. And so I apply a heuristic in my life that I don't short. Neither did I have any leverage. So I, and there are all sorts of reasons why it's a smart thing not to have leverage in your life in any way, shape, or form. And it's astounding to me 
and astounding to all sorts of people how many people take on leverage in their lives and utterly destroy themselves. Very briefly, there's a story during the financial crisis of a family, two sons that inherited a, a real estate empire uh, that had been built up by the dad worth three or four billion dollars, uh, unlevered. And in the decade before the financial crisis, the two sons decided that the way you do things is you lever yourselves, and they lost the whole thing in the financial crisis. So I was not, I didn't suffer from that. But uh, uh, what I did suffer from was a portfolio that went down by not, not, sharp, not far off 50%, which was particularly distressing. And then in a personal investment that my father had made, uh, some Swiss banker had convinced him that what he really needed to do was buy Lehman Brothers bonds. And um, so he actually, he told me recently that he actually got some recovery from it. But there's this famous moment when I'm yelling at him on the phone somewhere in my living room saying, you did what? <laughs> because, of course, he didn't consult with me on this. Um, I, so what happened to me is that, first of all, I think this idea that there are some super investors who are unemotional is not my experience of myself and I find it hard to believe that they're actually unemotional so I, I it was extremely distressing for, for me because uh, my self-image had been shattered and my self-image was of one that uh, somebody who would protect our investors through all environments and I thought I'd made conservative investments which I had made but I, I did not expect them to decline by as much as they had quotationally, and what happened to me is that I went numb. I spent quite a bit of time utterly numb during that period, but I had the, the not, so this is where, uh, so, so I think that something that I had to learn graduating from Oxford was to be more in my body and less in my mind. But this was an example, and somebody's nodding in the back, thank you, so I'm glad you understand that. You won't have that problem, but this was a moment where actually it was worthwhile for me to retreat into my mind and get super theoretical and to understand that these were quotational losses. And if I just lived out this period, it ought to work out fine, which is effectively what did happen. And I spent a lot of time reading the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius mainly, and that helped me a lot. But I also just kind of shut down, and by the way, uh, Feeling far better than I did then, that's kind of been what the last year has been for me. Uh, I have uh, my portfolios down about the same as the S&P, which is kind of like sad because I would have liked to have been down less than the S&P, but that's the way it is. That's what I got. I've got one investor that I got a call with in a day or two, very disappointed with me, who wants to, who's planning on pulling all of his money out. I don't know what he's going to say to me on the phone, but such is life. I mean, he, he, he knew what, and, and I have no doubt that things will uh, unfold well, but knowing myself, I know that the best thing to do is set myself up in such a way that when the proverbial hits the fan, I don't have to do very much because I don't trust myself. And I think that most investors should not trust themselves to act rationally and intelligently when the world is falling apart. So that's just me. Good evening. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'm, uh, my name is Ravi. I'm a lecturer at Corpus Christi, but I also taught here at Brazil for a while and uh, was a teaching assistant for late years in Cairo, who you mentioned in your book, who I've read a couple, yeah, well, read a couple, of, uh, couple of years back. Uh, my question is a bit technical. Um, so in my first uh, investment, I chose the cheapest broker in the UK. It was CVS uh, brokerage. And uh, a year or two later, they went uh, in administration. And Luckily, the portfolio was below the 85,000 pounds under the, um, that was guaranteed by the Financial Conduct Authority. And my question is, um, how much do you suggest or encourage retail investors to have their shares in their names and not use a particular broker? And how much risk is there, um, especially going through the financial crisis, how much risk is there from a brokerage going in administration or bankrupt and you losing some of your capital? in particular when that is above the, the thresholds or uh, what sort of advice do you have there? And uh, in particular, do you think the risk might, that risk might be available at a big brokerage like Interactive Brokers, for example, who used a lot of that uh, retail risk? Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, so you, uh, Peter Sinclair changed my life. He was the most extraordinary guy. Uh, I was, forgive me for those of you who never studied at Brazenose, but I, w I know where I was 
which was just out here in front of that, that big archway to the high street, when I walk up to Peter Sinclair and I say, I think I'd like to study economics. And I was a law student at the end of my second year. And Peter Sinclair, who I had never spoken to in my life, was just this guy who smiled at everybody in the quad. And he had these really, really sort of was this kind look for you. And, and, and he, I don't know what he did, but he, he just said, well, well, that's a nice idea. Why don't you come and talk to me for a bit? And then he fought some battle in college for me to, because it was just like very unusual to switch subjects. And I, I, I very sad, he was lost to COVID. He was one of the first people to, to be lost to COVID. But um, so, uh, but you've brought up, and I presume you're in economics, uh, but you know, you have the life that I wonder what would have happened if I'd gone your path. Uh, and, I, and it's part perhaps of why I'm here. Um, so he brings up a really good point, which is none of this counts if your assets are not safe. And uh, all those poor people who thought that their crypto, I don't know what the crypto is worth, but it's definitely worth nothing if you had it deposited at FTX. Uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, um, I don't know what the value of the deposits was, but it's in excess of 10 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of life savings, a lot of money that could have gone to all sorts of things, gone to pay for nurses for the people's parents, God knows what, that's gone up in flames. And... Um, during the time during the time of the financial crisis, I didn't bring it up to you, but the very, very worst part of it, which you see I've kind of conveniently forgotten, was not the quotational loss on the stocks, although that was bad enough. It was that one day, and about a Thursday, I discovered that there's questions about Bear Stearns and its viability, and all of the assets of the fund were at Bear Stearns. And so uh, I had an extremely unpleasant weekend where I was worried that on the Monday morning, what I would be doing is hiring some kind of bankruptcy lawyer to try and get our assets out of Bear Stearns. And I literally, well, I've had the opportunity to thank him in person. I was on this call on the Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. when J.P. Morgan announced that they had agreed to buy Bear Stearns. And J.P. Morgan says the words that seared on my brain, I'll never forget them. Come Monday morning, Bear Stearns will be open for business. Bear Stearns has the full faith, credit, and backing of J.P. Morgan. And I was like, I mean, it was the, the sigh of relief that I had was just enormous. And my heart goes out to you because when a broker is, when you're suddenly worried not about return on capital, but return of your capital, um, I believe that... Uh, Individual investors especially should be able to invest in institutions where that is just not possible and that they are well enough regulated that they cannot get themselves into a situation where they fail. And I'm shocked. I did not know that there was an institution in the UK that failed in that way. And what usually happens is that there's kind of a guarantee up to a certain value of the account, but beyond a certain value, there is no guarantee, and effectively, you lose money as a creditor of the institution. Um, so I, I, the, my only answer is it shouldn't be that way. And I spent, at the time of the financial crisis, I divided the assets of the fund in, amongst three different custodians, because I just wasn't sure, and custodians in different jurisdictions. Uh, today, the assets of the fund that I manage are in a, 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 the most extraordinarily boring bank you've never heard of, it's called Northern Trust, and there are one or two others like it, because they don't have investment banking, they don't do lending, they do nothing. <laughs> they just take care of your assets as a trust. Um, uh, I think it's unlikely that... I mean, if you want to own shares, then you have to have them custodied somewhere. And it's inconvenient to have them custody in your safe to ask for them so, so to be uh, registered with the, the depository trust company, for example. So you need a broker. And um, I would like to believe that a reputable broker, and, and it's worth saying that if you get into the law, if your securities are not levered and you're not playing some fancy option strategy, uh, then, you know, the law, at least in the United States, is that you own those assets directly. So they survive your... You, you, it's not that you have a claim as a creditor in bankruptcy. You actually own those shares. 
Uh, but it depends on the law, and it depend often there are different entities where you know they've applied different contra contractual terms. Um, so it, it requires study. I don't think it's fair to make individual investors do that study. I think that, that, that it's a place where it seems like regulation failed in your case. I think that there'll be lots of questions asked about all these crypto brokers where regulation clearly failed. The point of the regulations is to protect individual investors, and they did not do so. I can tell you that I don't have any crypto, but my God, the regulators are all over me all the time. There's a significant 10% of my costs to run my business are regulatory expenses. And um, I'm sorry you went through it, and ideally you wouldn't have had to do it. Yeah, yeah but you shouldn't have to be instructed by that. And, and, and individual investors deserve to be protected. That's part of what our taxes go to. That's what part of what people at the FSA here and FINMA and Switzerland and the SEC, they do a terrible job of it. But, and they should do better. You deserve to be protected and you won't. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, it's wrong. <laughs> and, and I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a model that uh, you shouldn't be expected to learn here, but it's certainly one to take with us. And it, so I run an investment conference for a group of, I think, sophisticated, thoughtful friends in, in the mountains every year. And I think that the crypto craze took over literally half of that group. And, um, and I think that this idea, you know, manias are not just something that we read about. They happen in real life. I think probably that we're at the end of a mania, and just in case there are any crypto diehard fans here, I'm not about to say that crypto is not going to exist ever. I'm not saying that blockchain is not a spectacular technology, which is kind of miraculous and genius the way it was put together. But uh, I think that we can all agree in the light of the day that there was an enormous craze going on, enormous mania. And that is just part of life. I'm certainly inoculated by it. You guys probably are inoculated by it. And we won't have another mania or craze until you guys are in your 40s. By which point, there'll be a whole new generation of investors who have not experienced anything like that personally. They don't have a story about a broker collapsing. They won't have heard about Robin Hood. It'll just be in the history books. And then the whole thing will repeat itself. And you know, if, if, if the power of reciprocation uh, is, is part of human nature, uh, then this is a kind of a negative part of human nature that we need to understand and sort ourselves in such a way that we're not exposed to it on the downside if we possibly can. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, you spoke about your experience of working in an untrustworthy environment at DH Flair, and I was wondering, yeah, how do you decide you know, when to trust people or perhaps not to trust people, both in your personal or in your investing life? It's, it's, a, spectacular, it's a spectacular question, and, um, and I don't think I'm very good at it. I think that there are some people who are better at it. And I'll, and I'll share with you one step further about how, um, uh, how difficult it is. is that, and this is really something that I can say is not just from a story. It's something that is true is that the, the charlatans and the shysters will dress themselves up nicely and they will be extraordinarily well-mannered and they will look good in the room. And they, 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 in a certain sense, have to be. And the people who are truly deeply honest and deeply ethical will not necessarily present very well. They might be quite gruff and not very pleasant to deal with. They don't have to be because the people who know they're honest, the people who know that they're worth dealing with, know and will come to them and deal with them, no matter how they dress and no matter what uh, exterior they show. So uh, the first impression can really, really deceive. And so what is the, so what, what are the, at the end of the day, the heuristics and rules of thumb for me? So uh, one of the most important ones for me is I try not to judge people based on physical appearance and based on a first meeting. And there's this famous idea that the first thought, the first impression we have that goes in is the one that stays with us. And we, we don't want to rely on that. So I'm constantly asking if somebody wants to engage with me, 
you know, send me, I'm almost knocked over the glass, send me your, I'm so incredibly clumsy, I don't understand that, always. Um, send me what you have, send me your annual report, send me your business plan, send me your academic paper, go in a certain way, go, uh, go and find out what's behind them, inform myself as much as I can on what they've produced. So if, if I, and, and you know, if, I think that we all ought to graduate knowing accounting, but that's okay. Everybody here who's interested in business will learn accounting. If you have any entity that has been run by the same person or the same group of people for any period of time and you start looking at their accounts, it starts becoming clear who's reporting in a clear and honest fashion and who's not. And one says, yeah, but their accounting rules, it's all the same. It's not all the same. There are all sorts of the decisions that will be made around the accounts. And there's even how they write about the accounts. So some people will have the PR department write the annual report. Some people will write a letter themselves. Some companies today don't even produce a letter. They just like send you the, the formal legal document and there's no letter because they can't be bothered. And they say, you know, go, go look at our presentation from the last quarter. That's all we've got. So those are all heuristics and clues as to what's going on. I think that the company that people keep, uh, and then, you know, to do something which around them and then see how they react and respond and pay close attention, to do something for them, to observe how they, they react in the environment. But I think your question is a really, really good one. I think that some people are better at it than others. I am aware that I'm not very good at it, and so I'm very interested in relying on the judgment of others. So I think that I got far better people into my life when I figured out that for one reason or another, Warren Buffett was better at it than I was. So if somebody came from Warren Buffett's circle, I was more likely to engage with them or if than not. And so, uh, and it, it's kind of a, in a certain way, a fun thing because there's no simple rule that allows you to win at that game in every circumstance in life. It's kind of, you just have to keep working at it and getting better over time, if you like. So. But the fact that you've asked the question is already puts you, because by asking the question, you've acknowledged in yourself that you don't actually really know how. And there's this incredible paradox that certainly works in life, that the minute we acknowledge our own weakness, somehow it becomes a strength because we now can go to work on it. So you've, in asking the question, you're acknowledging that you don't know. And so now, you, and it's great, sorry, I'm kind of giving you, because you had the courage to suck by saying it or at least acknowledge inside yourself. And the minute you do that, you kind of solve the problem. You haven't solved the problem, but you're more than halfway to actually getting to the promised land because you now, hey, I don't know about this. How do I do it? Let's ask the question. Let's acquire knowledge about how to do that. And so, you know, good job. So something that I do, so in this, this uh, sort of holiday card list, is that not everybody stays on the holiday card list. So I may not identify somebody who's behaving in a way that I don't like. They may get dropped from the holiday card list. And so it's kind of like a sorting mechanism. And I'm constantly doing that in a thousand different ways. And I think I, what I really regret is that I really started understanding and doing this when I was like 35 years old. If I'd started at your age, like if I'd had extra 15 years, oh my God, that 15 years makes a huge, huge, huge difference. I'll be in a very, very different place in 15 years' time, just not because of anything special other than I keep working at improving my heuristics, the people in my life, the people in their lives. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that, that, so everyone, my wife, whom I love dearly, always gives instructions in I was told that I have to take a question from the lady in the... Hi, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't even see you. No, no worries, no, no worries at all. Um, so I just wanted to go into more detail about the first question um, about politics in China. Um, so how much of your equity analysis of Chinese companies ends up being political analysis? And how much would that distribution compare to, say, your analysis of Indian equities? Thank you. So, yeah, it's a great question. And this guy, Tom Russo, who was recently interviewed by a friend, William Green, who, while I was at Brazenose, he was at Oriel College. I never really met him when I was at university, but we connected in New York. 
And Tom Russo just sold all his Chinese shares because he said, all investment analysis in China is political analysis, and he doesn't do political analysis. And um, the danger for anyone like me who's not educated in China or India or any other country is that we project all sorts of things that aren't, aren't the case. And so um, uh, I don't really want to engage in political analysis other than hanging out with my friends talking about what should happen in the world over a glass of wine, but I don't want to my investments to rely on it. And I think that where I come out on in, with China is that, uh, first of all, I, ha I want to, I don't particularly, I feel uncomfortable about the fact that China, by Western standards, is violating the human rights of Uyghurs. Uh, and, and there are all sorts of aspects of the society that are unfree. And what do I do about that? And I'm just not sure. At the same time, uh, the Communist Party has lifted more people out of poverty than any government has ever done before in the past. They've achieved extraordinary things, and I think that one has to give them credit for that. I also must not engage in cultural imperialism by assuming that my ideas, which I hold dearly and love of liberal democracy and freedom of speech and freedom of political expression has to apply in every country in the world. And, you know, I've, I've spent a certain amount of time reading Lee Kuan Yew, who's extraordinarily instructive. What an amazing man. Um, and, you know, I, I need to spend more time reading what he writes. But I come out with the bet that the Chinese leadership will act in a rational way, and that China is so deeply embedded in the world economy and vice versa that what is good, to, if China wants to grow, it needs a healthy economy in the world. China's not going to grow as some autarky all on its own. It has businesses which export all over the world. It imports from all over the world. It needs a global trading system that works. It is in China's interests to have a prosperous world. And I, you know, it would be very, very sad for the world. It would be kind of shocking if the leadership made decisions that were inimical to that. And they clearly did in the past. I mean, the whole sort of Marxist idea that, that kind of took over two countries was just disastrous for those countries. I don't think they're about to make that mistake again. And so the analysis that I go into is, so th th there are businesses in China that are inevitables. One that I wish, actually, that I'd found earlier is, a, is a, the largest liquor company in the world. is a company called Mao Tai, and uh, it's disgusting stuff. It really is. I visited the factory somewhere. I don't remember the name of the town. Um, uh, and that is kind of like a Chinese product, but it is an inevitable in China. I think that Alibaba is an inevitable. And what is good for Alibaba is good for China. What is, what is good for the world is good for Alibaba, is good for China. And so it's that level of analysis, if you like. So it's not really an analysis of the politics. But I do know people who read the five-year plan, who are investors in China who read the five-year plan. I have not yet read the five-year plan. But, um, but it's something that I struggle with on a daily basis. Hi, thank you. I was just wondering if you talk a bit more about why you never short things. Oh, yeah. It's a great pleasure. Why do you short things? So, so shorting stuff is a fool's game. Firstly, just from the simple mathematics of shorting, uh, if, um, so two simple ideas about, so if a, a stock is at 100, um, uh, I can buy it and I can make money multiples. If you go up to, and there are companies who, 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 where the stock price today relative to 20 years ago is many multiples of what it was. And there are businesses that just go through time and, and, and become businesses that are 20, 30 times larger. And if you, if, you, if you factor in cherry purchases, that doesn't mean that the actual business is larger, but the share price increases by that much. The maximum you can make by shorting is... 100%. Uh, you can make it because you could, the stock can only go from 100 to zero. And then if you short, the amount of stock that you have to, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, 
I don't even know if I could do a good job of explaining the mechanics, but at some point, you plan to make money by buying the stock back. So you sell it at 100 and you buy it back at 50. You, know, you made 50% on the money that you committed. Or you buy it at 100, hopefully, maybe it goes to zero, and then you buy back for nothing, and you make all 100 that you sold short. Uh, but as, you, as it goes the other way, and it often does, then um, uh, you know, 100 goes to 200, goes to 300, becomes an increasing size of your portfolio. So if I buy something and make it 5% of my portfolio and it goes down, now it's two and a half, it's dropped by 50%, and then it drops by another half, and, it, and so it's becoming a smaller and smaller and more and more insignificant part of my portfolio. By contrast, if I short it and it goes up, uh, it's becoming a larger and larger size of my portfolio. So uh, the people who short are constantly on edge, are constantly watching the movements of their stocks, are constantly worried about a piece of news that will come out, out that will go against and will drive the share price up and force them to pay closer attention. It's not a fun way to live your life, and it's not a smart way to run a portfolio. So I want to run my portfolio such that I can fall asleep for two weeks, and when I come back, it should be more or less the same, which you can do with anything that is kind of like going to unfold in a positive way over time, or you have that expectation. One last point, the, the trend of the stock market is to go up. So by shorting something, you put yourself against that trend. I can also say that I, you know, I get a headache if I have more than 15 positions in the portfolio. The only way you account for risk from shorting is that you need to have lots of, lots of small positions, and that just, you know, that multiplies the amount of work and the number of things that you need to keep track of. So, but you know, I just tell you, I want other people to short. That's great. It's just that I don't want to short. So, you know, on some level, the stock market is a zero-sum game. So it's okay for other people to short. That's fine. It's a free world. Go ahead. But, you know, another way of seeing the stock market is, is, a, is a, it is a mechanism by which money is transferred from the ignorant to the wise. And so, you, you know, I mean, it's not a very nice way of looking at it. And I, you know, from a moral philosophy standpoint, there's a real question of what the hell am I doing? Because it, to the extent that the world's wealth is zero sum, then all I'm trying to do is accumulating a slightly higher proportion of it for my investors. Is that a particularly moral activity? Possibly not. The one thing that I can come up with is that I can say, well, I'm trying to provide better stewardship and that the companies that are in my portfolio will make better capital allocation decisions because I'm a shareholder and I'm behaving rationally. So there, are, there is a case that I can make. But, um, but there's my argument for not shorting. And I shorted three stocks and made me super unhappy, and now I'm far happier. So. Uh, thank you, Guy, for the incredible talk. Uh, I thought I'd ask about this investment because it's from my home state of New Jersey. Um, so how has your experience investing in Horsehead Holdings changed the way you invest? Are there new things you've added to your checklist, uh, new red flags? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for brought, bringing up one of my, what is my most painful mistake, probably. Uh, I had, and it's good, it's good to rub your nose in your mistakes. So thank you. Thank you for telling me I suck. You know, is he, in other words, he just said, hey, guy, you really suck. You know, just let, let me, let's see if you talk about it. So. Uh, I put, um, so I was running about $200 million at the time. Total amount invested was about $12 million. Uh, it appreciated to be as high as $18 million, And then uh, it went to zero. <laughs> and um, so in, in our case, so this, so I talked about how people always want stuff, uh, the stuff more cheaply, cheaper. And slightly esoteric, but this is a company that recycles zinc. And it does it through uh, taking the um, uh, waste material from mini mills. So mini mills are a way of making steel where you recycle old steel. I don't do anything in metals anymore, by the way. That was one big lesson. I don't do anything in commodities. But um, so they would recycle that zinc, and they would do that using a, um, a uh, a burning process, they'd put it into a furnace. And what they developed was they were the lowest cost operator to do it, and they had a system of uh, collecting all of these waste materials from all these mini mills around the United States 
such that they were kind of like the only game doing it. And so these mills could, uh, they would pay to have this taken away, and they were the only people who could process it. So without diving too deep into it, there's kind of like an Amazon quality to that, where the more volume you have, the more efficient you are, the more you're doing good for all of those mills, you're creating zinc where otherwise it would have just been a waste product. And they had this great idea to shift the industrial process by which they were doing it to an electrolytic process, which was far cleaner, far nicer. Uh, and But they borrowed money to do it. They should not have borrowed money. They should have done an equity raise. That set up leverage on their balance sheet. And over time, uh, it took far longer for them to develop this plant. It was far more expensive and took far longer. And a vulture fund bought up without... So, so in the... Sorry, this is like into the weeds. So some people might be zoned out. I apologize to you. But in the equities markets, they're, high, they're far more regulated. And if you engage in insider-type transactions or transactions with the company, or if you become a shareholder above a certain level, you have to report that to the market. The market has the right to know. Debt markets, for reasons that are not clear to me, actually, I can give the reasons why, are far less regulated. So. A vulture fund gets control of enough debt of this company that they can then create influence for themselves over the management, convince the management that they shouldn't side with the shareholders, but should side with them. And actually, wouldn't it be fun to take the company through a bankruptcy process, which would leave them with all of the company, and they kind of expropriate the shareholders, which is kind of fun. I was shocked to discover this had happened. So in any case, there's the story, very painful. Um, uh, a few things that I learned. At the time I invested in the company, it had no leverage. But I wasn't paying close enough attention to the fact that they took on debt to fund this plant, which I really ought to have known better. I mean, this is not, this is not rocket science. It really wasn't. And I was just not paying attention. I could easily have paid attention to that. So I've added a kind of an in-flight checklist item, which is, have they taken on any new debt? Have they taken on significant, significant leverage in any particular period? Uh, the second thing that it made me revise something in the book, so I gave you this idea that in trying to figure out if you want to be uh, around people or not, read the material first. Read what they've produced, their essay, their annual report, their accounts, because you'll learn stuff about them. Uh, and I had this, I took it to the extreme, which was just read what they produce, don't meet with the management. And I had asked a number of times to visit the plant. And they had said, oh, not, not this year, not, not right now. We're in the quiet period. And what I regret is that even if I'd had no meetings, I should have traveled to the site of the plant, Mooresboro in North Carolina. We even have family nearby. Because I think I would have learned stuff by kicking the tires, even by being in the Starbucks outside the plant, because I would have talked to somebody who had come out of the plant. I would have bought them a coffee or something. So. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of like in the weeds kinds of lessons, but pay attention to whether take, somebody takes on leverage. I just go briefly to something that Warren Buffett told me at the lunch that I had, which was really shocking. He said he didn't ever want to take on a lot of leverage because he didn't want to discover what kind of behavior he's capable of. And that's Warren Buffett speaking. So why was I not paying attention to this company taking on leverage? And, um, uh, you know, I have this, so I need to do a second edition or something, rewrite that chapter in the book. I say, don't meet with management. That's a really dumb idea. So, you know, yes, meet with management. Seek to meet with management. Seek to learn as much as you can from wherever you can. So, you just want your phone back? Or, no? Anything good on it? No? Uh, Guy, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, <clears throat> so, I just have some questions regarding your. Uh, comments on the shifting world order, you know, the shift away from the US at its center along with its liberal allies towards something more uh, multipolar, I guess. Um, how do you feel about the macroeconomic situation in the Western economies, regards to you know, the public uh, deficits, the rising leverage, and the current account deficits we often see, especially in the US, EU, UK? Do you have any comments on that? Does that worry you? Yeah, so um, I don't think that it has any impact on the way we ought to invest or the way I'm investing. Um, we would all like the world to be like Switzerland, which has very, very good public finances in which uh, 
both local and the federal government, I haven't looked at it recently, often run as a surplus, uh, where they carefully look to see how they fund every sort of single little bit of expenditure. Um, and the rest of the world doesn't operate that way for all sorts of structural reasons. I just give you one very simple idea that I'm sure that if we could go back and change the US Constitution, it would be great. But in Switzerland, uh, the only taxes that the federal government can levy, they can levy kind of like some excise taxes, uh, some taxes on securities. What they cannot levy is uh, income taxes on the population. The only entities in Switzerland that can do that are the cantons, or the equivalent of states in the United States. And so the federal government, which needs money, has to negotiate with the cantons. And the cantons levy income taxes and then hand some of those over to the federal government, which creates a natural restraint on, um, on excessive spending at a federal level. By contrast, in the United States, the federal government can levy taxes directly on the population. And so it has 300 something million people who can't negotiate with it, rather than the, federal, the, the, the cantons who do. So you have a far less good fiscal situation in the United States. By contrast, though, you know there are, there are many things in the United States that are just extraordinary. And um, you know, I don't know which US politician talked about the United States as being an exceptional country. It is an exceptional country. And there are all sorts of, uh, I, I think, objective facts that one can point at. For example, um, the United States has got on its eastern border fish, and on its western border fish, and on its northern border it's got the most docile nation on the planet, and on its southern border, other than a very feisty Mexican wife, it's got a, it's got a country that is basically it's not at war with. That's something extraordinary. It's got a vast continent. It's, it's self-sufficient in all of its key. It's self-sufficient in food. It's self-sufficient in energy, and it's got this extraordinarily dynamic population. And so. Um, there are many other positive things going for it. I think that um, we're, I, I don't know how the world will unfold. Will, will we go through a decade of misery, or is this going to, what we're going through this year, is it going to be a short blip that's going to come to an end? At the end of the day, um, there's, in this regard, it's good to be an optimist. So I'm optimistic that in 50 years' time, we in the West will be wealthier and that the United States will be wealthier in spite of enormous problems. And if you look at the purchasing power of the US dollar today versus 100 years ago, the dollar continuously depreciates. Inflation is constantly a problem. But the fact of the matter is people have gotten wealthier. So there are enormous problems, but the uh, positives outweigh the negatives. And for the sake, it's fun to talk about. And if you, and I'll, so another model to put in your head. The most important models you should get from your academic studies. But I, when I learned this, so there are people. So there's a guy who's Swiss who lives in Hong Kong, and he writes something. I've forgotten his name. He writes a report called the Doom, Doom and Gloom report. There we go. My God, you're an investor responsible for people's money, and he, you know he's got he's got these like these, these headlines. Like, oh my God, I have to pay attention to this. Until I finally realized that he's just playing a game of grabbing my attention by putting the fear of God into me that something terrible is going to happen. And if I don't read his report right now and ideally subscribe to the expensive version, I might not be prepared to deal with it. And so there will, and, and this, this is a pattern that is particularly pronounced in the boom, doom, and gloom report, but it also is how newspapers sell copy and how Bloomberg gets you to sign on and read. So that is just an element of the environment that one's dealing with. And it's kind of fun to talk about. I mean, you know, look, um, uh, they do research. They have research analysts. You know, they, they're kind of figuring out what is going to grab somebody's attention the best. So this has been highly engineered to grab our attention. And so when you ask that question, you know, I know that there's, a, you know, if you read about something in that direction, it's fun to talk about. You know, we can all opine what's the future going to look like, what's the value of the dollar going to be, is it all going to go to hell in a handbasket? And I'm always so impressed. I mean, I was reading today that uh, Berkshire Hathaway has just bought, it's increased 
the size of its bet in these Japanese trading companies by 1% each. So now it doesn't own 5%, it owns 6%. So while we're all debating what the future of the world is, Warren Buffett is quietly buying stuff, you know? And, uh, and pardon? He's optimistic, but he's also engineered his environment such that if, if there's something that I could do in my environment is that I want, and you know, everybody who's in this business wants this, I want permanent capital so I don't have to think about the conversation I'm going to have to have with this investor in a couple of days who's disappointed that, I haven't, that I've declined by the same amount as the S&P. Whereas I'd rather think about, huh, those Ch Japanese trading companies approximate to China, Japan's going to remain firmly in the West. They're probably going to benefit from a rise in China. That's a good way to bet on a rise in China. That's a way better way to think. So. Um, thanks very much, Kai. This is an industry professional here. Well, <laughs> um, no, it's, it's fascinating just um, hearing your perspective, and thank you for speaking so honestly. A lot of points uh, resonated with me, I think particularly around working with people you respect and, and doing something uh, you really enjoy. And I hope people in the room who are still at university now find that the investing world can, can, can do that for them because it, it is fascinating. On that front, I am, I am going to say you're being very modest about your book. Um, if you haven't read it, it is really, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's, it is absolutely excellent. So, and um, it's a brilliant intro uh, into investing. And I, I would say you compare it with Morgan Housel's The Psychology of Money, which, which is also a fantastic book. I don't, don't know if you've he's, he's sold far more copies than mine. Huh? Well, I'm, 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 try, I'm trying to do my bit to help you catch up. Thank you so uh, much, Greg. <laughs> I, I will never catch up with Morgan Housel. <laughs> no, no, he's a phenomenon. Um, and it, my question, and, and I, if you've spoken about the, the Chinese names and alluded to them today, so maybe we park those for, for the sake of this question. Um, but you know, investing is about this combination of you know, quality of company and price you pay for it. So my question would be, Chinese names aside, what is the investment you have today that you are most excited about that is the most sort of controversial or difficult to explain to clients? Well, I, I try not to explain any of them to clients. I just say, here's what you got. But, and, um, <laughs> but actually, we've, we've relented on that a little bit, so there are some client conversations. I mean, and I don't think it just comes down to... Uh, Price and quality, although obviously those are two really key criteria, because some some companies present a very broad range of outcomes, and some companies present a narrow range of outcomes. And is it broad? Um, does it cover a negative? Is is the range of outcomes so broad that it could turn out to be a zero? In which case, maybe it should. But I think that the, the company that I would be most excited to talk about. So, I feel like, and this is what we're talking about here, is portfolio construction. So. One way that I look at, I've tried to explain, you, you need to tell me whether this would fly with your clients. So but I try to explain that I'm a bit like a hunter-gatherer who is sitting at the um, entrance to his cave. And deep inside the cave is really damn safe, even though it's very dark and dank. And then out there, there are kind of like woolly mammoths, which are beautiful things to eat. But you've got to brave the saber-toothed tiger in order to get there. And you know, if you go out hunting for woolly mammoths, you might have a saber-toothed tiger that takes you out, and then you don't survive. And so you know, deep inside, so the barbell approach to investing is that deep inside my cave, there's kind of these boring companies that I know will survive pretty much nuclear Armageddon. But then you want to go outside the cave every now and then and kind of go and find something. And, and so I have two two companies in my portfolio that are about 15% each, uh, and they started off as 3% positions, so they've kind of ballooned. And um, I only have two investments in India. I've only made three in my life, even though I'm associated a lot with India. And uh, this is a company called India Energy Exchange, and it kind of hits a beautiful um, sweet spot of so many things. So first of all, exchange businesses have been extraordinarily successful, a company, I'm sorry for those of you who are not particularly interested in this, but it's fascinating to me, there's a company called Intercontinental Exchange that bought the New York Stock Exchange, more and more products trade on exchanges, <clears throat> and even though the area was made far more competitive, this company's done extraordinarily well. Uh, India Energy Exchange is in the business of trading energy, there's an exchange in Europe called European Energy Exchange. It turns out that in a world of um, uh, 
green power and power coming from solar and from wind, uh, you, those are intermittent sources, and one of the best ways to decide whether to switch, or the best way to decide whether to switch a plant on or off is to have a continuous price for power. And so it turns out it's a natural monopoly. This company, even though it's not the only company doing it, has the overwhelming majority of energy trading in India. Uh, their market share is likely to go through the roof. Uh, the amount of energy that India produces is way below what it will be when it's finally got the same income levels as we do. So I'm excited about that. But the outcome for the company is, um, you know, there, there, there are things that could come out of the blue that could make it a zero. So, you know, <laughs> welcome to my world. Uh, and that's something that I'm living with. I think that what yeah, I'm feeling like that shift in the room that says that we need to take one or two more questions. And um, I, I know that I'm not the guy who's in charge of that, but. And then, so, so unless there's, so put, anybody who doesn't have their hand up now is definitely not going to ask a question. We've got one person, two people, three people, four people, and that's it. And les jeux sont faits. So question one, two, three, and four over there, you guys, last away. Hi, Guy. So um, I had a question. Working? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I had a question about... Um, potential struggles from moving from an academic environment to a non-academic one. Um, so the way I think is that academic environment sort of wires you to gain some sort of acknowledgement from a small set of group of people who you really admire, may it be uh, your tutors, your professors, who is your mentor, or if you're sending an academic paper, then it's your reviewers. And so they're probably experts in the field, but those are the narrow set of people you admire. And then, um, so, at times when you're moving into something which is no longer, let's say, um, like investment is some sort of an art, not an entirely a science, um, how did you come to create original ideas and also gain confidence in them? Because none of the ideas are going to be entirely original. They're going to build on some other people's ideas. But then how do you dissociate, let's say, just not adding value to an idea because it's by someone who you really admire, but judging it based on the merit of its own idea, even your own ideas compared to someone else, you might be at odds with someone you admire and so on. Yeah, and so, the, so there are probably many different ways to understand the question and answer it. So I'm going to take one particular tack, which I hope answers and responds to some of what you're feeling. And um, I think the way I see it is, and, and it's kind of like part of the, the mental flexibility that we need to be, to succeed is, so we need to understand the rules of the institution that we're in, or that the environment that we're in. And we need to be aware that as we move through different environments, the rules may shift, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly. So in an academic environment, plagiarism is frowned upon. It can get you thrown out. It can, you know, it's a very bad thing to do, and we certainly should not plagiarize. That's true in an academic world. It is absolutely untrue in the business world. So, you know, Manish Pabrai famously, famously calls it cloning, but another word for it is, well, it's not really plagiarism, but it's, it's looking for the best ideas and copying them. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in the business world unless they're protected by some kind of intellectual property, but the vast majority of them are not. Uh, of, so that, that's the first place. And then the second sort of like rather liberating attribute of, the world in which I operate is that um, I don't need the approval of my peers as much as I need to show results on paper. If I can show results on paper, then the approval of the peers will come, if you like. So, but I think that what comes up for me as you say that is that I think that too often we don't realize that the, the rules where we're operating are a different set of rules to the ones that we think are the rules. And I think that if I consider myself as a, somebody who immigrated to the UK, and spent a large part of the last 20 years outside of the UK, and now we, I'm spending more time in the UK, I think I'm still learning the rules of the United Kingdom, how to operate in the UK. And I think that um, if I'd have been more humble about learning those rules and figuring them out, I would have done better. So you know, you're kind of making yourself aware that if you leave academia and go into the business world, there'll be a different set of rules that apply. The sooner you can figure those out, the better. You know? So but thanks for the question. Num that was number one, number two. 
in respect of people who were like, damn, that was fun, but I need to go. Right. So <clears throat> something I'm wondering about is as a fundamental value investor, I just want to hear your thoughts, your perspectives, and your interpretations on the growing prevalence of systematic strategies and quantitative investments. Like, if you look over the past two, three decades, there's going to be a clear trend. Uh, as time goes on, more and more capital is allocated to systematic strategies. And so I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Is there anybody who's studying? Thank you. And is there anybody studying computer science in the room? OK. So uh, thank you. Uh, um, what year are you in, if I may ask? Okay, so I, I, I'll just try this out for a second, see, what, see if you come up. So um, I want you to write a software program or somebody you know to write a software program that is ex going to examine a social network which has 1,000 individuals in it, so 1,000 nodes, and uh, you know, it, it randomly allocated edges, which would be a connection between, and the software program is going to examine each one of those nodes and edges to see what attributes they have. Uh, how much time would it take for the software program to do that? So, so that, that's, thank you. You gave the answer that I wanted to give. Now could you explain what that means to everyone who didn't understand it? So thank you, and this comes back to your question. For those of you who are wondering where the hell we're going, so one of the reasons why I often get to bed at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning is that like at 2 a.m. in the morning, I decide randomly that I'm going to sign on for a computer science course on Coursera, which I literally did once. And this is lecture one in this computer science course. And here's what just blew me away. So you know, a social network with 1,000 people is not a very large social network. but it turns out, at least according to this lecture and confirmed by my Austrian friend in the back of the room, who unprompted by me gave the, 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 a similar answer, would require effectively infinite amount of computing power or more computing power than we have. So what I learned about computer science is that a big part of computer science is to figure out what problems can we solve given the computing power that we have because it's very easy for even a layperson to configure or to define a problem such that you would require infinite computing power. So, so uh, uh, systemic trading, using computing algorithms. Uh, this guy, Simon, mathematician, I call him Jim Simon. He's got renaissance. He's uh, done something extraordinary. As I understand it, he's doing it in very, very, very short time frame. So he's looking at movement of security prices in um, milliseconds and developing trading strategies with the help of computers. So he has managed, as a mathematician, to define uh, a mathematical problem that he can solve that enables him to make money. And it's, as I understand it, not because I'm in it, it's combined with, for example, having your computers hooked up to the right exchange to get the information soon enough. Uh, and it's not a world that I understand very well. But so at a very, very short time frame, he's managed to do something, and he takes up a certain proportion of the market. When people uncover things that they can do, they make so much money that very soon their problem is, is that they can't deploy the capital at those high rates of return. I think that given the nature of uh, computing and the vast number of problems that there are to solve, that world may expand, expand just a little bit. But I think there will be plenty left for the rest of us. I'm, that guy is operating in terms of micro milliseconds and, and exploiting price anomalies. I'm operating in terms of years. And I had this idea, and sorry to dive into the weeds, this is fun for me. What if you could write an AI that could analyze all the text output of every company and 
figure out on its own through machine learning which companies would generate uh, a high return for their investors and which would not. And I figured out through some of this computer science, and I really just listened to the first two paragraphs, and then, as my wife knows, my interest moved on to something else, and I never finished the course. Uh, but how great is Coursera that you can do that? Um, I figured out that, that it was that you don't have enough data because, you know, just to do self-driving cars, the key limiting factor is the amount of data that they have. They just don't have enough data, and there's certainly not enough data when it comes to companies. So I think that, you know, long, long question cut short. Uh, it's amazing that Simon with Renaissance Technologies has done what he's done. It's a small world of very rich mathematicians, uh, but there's plenty of space for the rest of us. And if it's a world that you want to get into, you know, it's not going to do much for the public good, but it's not a terrible idea to live a great life if you're a good mathematician. So thank you for the question. I hope that's helpful. Two more, and then I, we, we're released. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for the talk. My question is quite similar to the previous one in that uh, you mentioned that how there's a lot of space beyond quantitative investment, but I think what I've observed at least, I know Aquamarine has been around for 25 years, and that competition in the fundamental equity space has increased like drastically over the last 25 years. And I know, like for example, Buffett talks about stepping over one-foot hurdles instead of 10-foot hurdles. So how do you believe that yourself as an investor uh, is able to position yourself to step over those one-foot hurdles, given that competition has increased so much and it's much harder to generate kind of returns above market, and in the same vein, is there a new area that you think where we can return to the equity markets of like the 60s and the 50s, where there were one-foot hurdles all over the place? So thank you. So um, somebody here, you, you asked me about horse heads, just because you wanted to like put some pain onto me. And you know, I don't know is the answer, and I agree with you. So one of the first investments that I made, so on, the first day of our honeymoon, I wake up to discover that this company, Weetabix, 50% market share, dominant brand, trading at four times earnings, no debt. It's wonderful, you know, family-owned business in, with some publicly traded shares is being bought out for like three times the price I paid for it, and it was so freaking easy, and like none of that exists anymore. And you're right, everybody's a fundamental investor, and I also have significant, um, it's also, you know, if I had permanent capital, my life would be easier. And so I don't know the answer to the question, but I find myself in the business that I'm in, at the place that I'm in, the way I had an investor say to me that uh, the reason, you know, he, he was disappointed, mildly disappointed that I hadn't outperformed the S&P by much, but he would not have invested in equities in the first place had he not invested in my fund. So I kind of can justify the fund, even if I end up not outperforming the S&P, by giving some people, at least in my circle, the confidence to invest in equities where they wouldn't have otherwise have done. So you ask a great question, and I wish I had a good answer for it. I don't. I think that um, my, my goal is to build an environment. So uh, through the people I have in my life, through my work environment, through the kind of investors that I have that perhaps will give me a behavioral advantage rather than an analytical advantage. But, but you know, it's, it's far less than I would like to have. But, you know, that's what I'm faced with. And I'm, I'm comforted a little bit by these words of Charlie Munger. It's like, this isn't supposed to be easy. If it was, everybody would be doing it. And, um, but that's a real challenge, real challenge. I wish I could tell you I got one foot hurdles to jump over. I don't. You know, I'm looking for them. If you see them, tell me. <laughs> Thanks for the question, and thanks for like inflicting just a little bit of pain, reminding me. <laughs> but at last question, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. I was wondering, with the rise of the retail investor and also of ETFs, where you can just for very low fee invest in a whole index or uh, a whole industry, how do you think that's going to affect mutual funds, which have much higher fees over the coming years? So. Um, ETFs is kind of like this broad, as I see it, is this broad range. It's got something that is really superb and excellent, which is the ability to invest in indexes at a very, very low cost. And to the extent that somebody I care about 
tells me that they're investing in the index through a low-cost ETF, then my blessing to them. But, but the ETF world is also full of all sorts of weird and wonderful products that are really bad idea. 